Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedicase. I've got a couple of theology degrees. I'm working on another in philosophy of religion. And throughout my time in my studies, I've had some really great conversations with amazing people. But unfortunately, I have not recorded those conversations. So the goal of this podcast then is to record conversations just like that, uh, to upload them, to share them with you so that you get to learn as I learn. Uh, I have experts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. And uh, I love thinking about these cool things, so you're invited to come think with me. Today's episode is going to be in the category of life. Uh, we're going to be going over uh, a bit of the life of my friend Guillaume Bignon, Dr. Guillaume Bignon. And uh, we're going to be looking at his new book, his forthcoming book, Confessions of a French Atheist, <clears throat> How God Hijacked My Quest to Disprove the Christian Faith. So uh, it's going to be fun because there is apologetics in there. There is... Uh, uh, yeah, all sorts of questions and, and faith and reason going on, but it's in a narrative. It's in his life story, which is really cool. We're not gonna be able to cover the whole thing. And if we could, that'd be a waste because then you wouldn't go buy the book. We're gonna be talking about some excerpts of it and uh, some of his favorite um, apologetics and answers to uh, his, his questions that led him and continue to pull him down the path of faith. Before we do that, though, uh, I want to thank everyone over on Patreon. You guys are really making this happen. As you can see, I got some new gear. Um, it's because you guys, I uh, thank you for all the support. So as a lot of you know, I want to do this full time and, uh, you guys are making it happen. So if you have benefited from this podcast, if this is your favorite podcast, um, one of those two, either or both, please consider supporting the podcast. Click on the link in the description. You can become a Patreon patron, a supporter of the show there. Um, and you get all sorts of goodies at different levels of support. So please go do that. Another way to support is to like and comment on this podcast. Uh, are on the YouTube version of this podcast. And if you're listening audio, even if you're not, please go over to Apple Podcasts, leave me a five-star review, and uh, leave me a comment over there too. You can join the conversation if you go to the Facebook group, Parker's Pensies Ponciers. And I don't know if that's right. I'm going to ask Guillaume how to, how to pronounce that. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of the guests in there and we have fantastic conversations. It's becoming my favorite uh, Facebook group, which is weird, but it's cool. So, uh, without further ado, let me bring him on in. Guillaume, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast, man. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's good seeing you, Parker. Yeah, you too. So, um, first things first, uh, people need to hear the, the proper pronunciation of the podcast again. Can you can you pronounce it nice and clear for us? It's Parker Pensée. Pensée. So, les Pensées de Parker. Is there we go. If you do the full thing in French. Les That's Pensées fantastic. de Pascal, les Pensées de Parker. That's good. Uh, so, pensée, pensée, right? Yes. Les pensées. Um, Les pensées. That's that's plural. I've always been confused on this. What's the yes. what's the singular? Well, how how do you just say thought? Uh, la pensée. So you oh. pr pronounce it the same, except there's not an s at the end. But the okay. s of pensée is silent anyway. Right. That's what the French do is throw in all sorts of silent letters just for yeah. decoration. Yeah. So I I had to Google Translate um, like thinkers, and it came out pensier. Um, I don't know if that's right. Can you pronounce that one for me? Yes, penseur. Ah, yeah. penseur. Okay. Yes, <laughs> penseur. Dang it. Le oh, penseur. Man. Le yeah, penseur is that famous uh, uh, sculpture by Rodin, uh, the, the thinker, you know? Yeah, that's, yeah, uh, right. Le, le penseur de Rodin. I did not know that. I didn't know it was a French thing. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great, man. That's so good. Um, that's huge. So today is going to be a little bit different we're not just uh going over propositions and uh and pap we're not destroying pap tonight i don't think we might but <laughs> um but we're talking about your life story man we're talking about confessions of a french atheist and uh before we jump in i wanted to get a little bit about the uh the impetus for this project uh like why why this project why now yes uh so the why this project is very much um i mean I guess one needs almost an excuse or a justification for writing their life story when they're barely 40, <laughs> uh, which I just turned uh, earlier this year. Um, Congrats. But uh, yeah, so I've been uh, quite active in researching and writing and speaking on various Christian theology, philosophy books um, on topics. And um, I have, I mean, it's when I started to speak at conferences uh, discussing some serious academic topic that people started to be surprised to see a Frenchman in evangelical yeah. Christian circles uh, in the U.S. and asked me how I uh, found my way there. 
And I've uh, had to explain to some of them, well, here's the story of how uh, I came from a French atheism into uh, Christian scholarship. And uh, the story really resonated with them. A lot of them uh, were really uh, excited to hear about this uh, transformation, a transformed life. And there's a lot of entertaining parts of my, uh, of my life. And I thought that this would be a good idea to uh, share in writing the, the fun life story uh, that happened to me, right? I mean, I, I kind of phrase it passively, right? It's a very Calvinist thing, <laughs> Calvinist thing of, of me uh, to say that this is what God did uh, yeah. all throughout. But um, I thought it would be a good idea to tell this life story um, and do so in a way that raises all the important intellectual questions that uh, were involved in my change of view, obviously, a change of worldview. Um, but in the context that, that gives the full picture, that says, here are some of the big ideas that I was confronted with and some of the big intellectual changes that I had to make. Uh, but also, here's all of the things that happened to me, like emotionally speaking, like here's, here's the experiences that happened to me. And the whole deal gives a complete picture of why is it that I became a Christian? It's not entirely emotional, it's not entirely intellectual, but the both together really uh, give the, the right uh, description of what happened to me. Yeah. Um, and obviously it's, uh, it's also an evangelistic project uh, because I'm telling a fun story of what happened to me, but I'm obviously suggesting that others should follow suit. Um, yeah. So uh, that's a bit of my desire in writing this book is to give that, uh, that entertaining story, that entertaining account where people can pick it up and read it on the beach. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, they're also getting a lot of the apologetic material, the conversations that I had uh, and the big questions that I raised. Uh, and they're challenged intellectually as much as they are entertained in reading my story. Yeah. Well, um, I read it, man. It was, it was, uh, and is very entertaining. Uh, I have the advanced copy. I didn't get a, a chance to read. Uh, you sent me over another one with some added stuff. So I get to uh, look forward to, to reading all the extra stuff that I missed out on. Um, uh, just a quick question, man. And, and maybe you don't know this, but we are surprised to, us Americans and, and maybe even the Brits to hear your French accent. And, and why is that surprising to hear about a French Calvinist uh, philosophical theologian? Like what, any idea, like why, what, what's the state of Christianity in France? Do you, I mean, do you, uh, yeah, so I, I can give you a little bit of my anecdotal, uh, like an anecdotal uh, yeah, experience. Yeah. Um for what I saw or, uh, surrounding me, and that's consistent with what you're describing, that it mm -hmm. would be so really surprising because um, I grew up uh, in an environment that was uh, religious, so it was uh, nominally Catholic, which means that we did go to Mass and we did go through the religious rituals, um, but really didn't seem to be believing it very uh, meaningfully. Uh, and so that's that's why when I was old enough to tell my parents that I didn't believe any of this, I just stopped practicing. And it was not a huge deal. Like They didn't really see this as uh, the world falling apart or anything. It's just like, OK, well, they're not doing it anymore. And that's it. And my life as an atheist was not very different than the uh, childhood I had growing up uh, on the church pews. Um, so that environment, uh, again, maybe I'm committing the mistake of projecting on everybody else with sure. my experience, but it seems like I was really not the only one. And a lot of people in my generation grew up with uh, practicing Catholic parents in France, uh, but not a real expression of any sort of deep life commitment that changes the way you live. Uh, it's a little bit, you know, a bit tradition, maybe a little bit of superstition. Um, and uh, when you shake it off when in young adulthood, you just don't turn back and you're an atheist uh, or agnostic or however people might uh, define themselves, just non-religious. Um, and it seems like that has been very common on my generation. So mm -hmm. um, that would explain why there's not all that many folks who not only still practice uh, any sort of religious faith, but also would have an evangelical, very deep, meaningful uh, commitment to the truthfulness of scripture, to the, yeah. an important uh, life-giving relationship with Jesus, uh, those sorts of things that we think of the pillars of evangelicalism. Yeah. Um, that's, that's not really uh, easy to find uh, in France. So that, that's kind of my anecdotal 
experience and surroundings. But then um, there's maybe a little bit more of an academic answer uh, to that question of why, you know, like when you think of, well, you, you, you didn't stress that I'm a Christian, this guy, I'm a Calvinist. Well, when you think <laughs> of Calvin, I mean, yeah. there is a strong historical background for French uh, theologians and reformed theologians uh, with Calvin. But there, I think that some of the history of the world of religion explain a little bit. Like whatever uh, remnant of Protestants might have been in France were simply just massacred and uh, fled the country. Um, so uh, post the Reformation, this is the sad reality that uh, if you find a Protestant in France, he might have been suicidal. You know? uh, yeah. So uh, some some of those, so it's not to say that everyone left, but the so-called Huguenots that uh, so abundantly came to the U.S. and other countries fled France. Uh, and so that explains, again, the why the ratio of Protestants uh, historically might have been lower than you would expect. Yeah. Well, so uh, I took a class on Calvin at uh, TEDS, and uh, uh, Dr. Scott Manich taught that class, and we got to learn about Calvin's, all his um, his secret missionary. Uh, uh, he, he sent a bunch of missionaries back into France, and, uh, and this really cool thing happening. And I thought, man, dude, Guillaume is like, he's coming full circle. Like, Calvin would be proud, and then I would remember, like, oh, but Guillaume's a Baptist, and, and Calvin wouldn't be that proud. <laughs> 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 yeah, he might he might not have loved me on on that. Uh, I thought the same yeah. thing. Yeah, he, same same thing about me. But yeah. uh, well, when I think about uh, your your story here, and you say you know you just kind of I don't know you you shook off your childhood faith, if you can even call it faith, uh, your childhood religion. You shook it off. Maybe you just kind of walked out of it. Was was there anything that led to that? Was there any like did you discover the problem of evil, or was it kind of just like this doesn't mean much to me? So. I'm just going to stop identifying this way. Yeah, no, uh, intellectually speaking, there was never really a, a strong belief that there was a creator, that the, that the miracles were real, or that uh, there was anything uh, good in the Bible. So uh, I didn't have to shake that off. It was just never there. Um, and we were just practicing and simply following along with what uh, our parents had been doing. Um, so when I uh, shook it off, it was like when I stopped, what, what led to that is simply that growing up a little bit more mm. we started to have more permissions and our parents simply decided to leave us the choice of what to do and i have an older brother uh, i have a, an older brother and a younger sister and my older brother uh just went ahead and said All right, i'm not interested i'm not going anymore and i followed suit i figured mm. this is safe I, you know he, he's yeah. opening the way this is safe <laughs> let me follow suit and that's good we now can uh, sleep in on sunday morning and watch cartoons so yeah. <laughs> that's uh that, that was really not not a huge uh, life shift when that happened. Yeah, but but I did grow to like I, I did um, develop a certain amount of bitterness and sarcasm, uh, like uh, really um, uh, looking down on religion as a result. So it's, mm. it wasn't like just uh, uh, impassable, like oh you know like uh, well let's just shift lives and that's okay. Um, it wasn't a huge change in belief. It was a change in practice. And also came with resentment of have, having the feeling that I wasted all of this time on the church pews and that people um, absorbed by the French culture. I mean, I just absorbed the, the presuppositions of my environment, which was that if you really are religious, if you really believe that God exists, you must be extremely superstitious and probably didn't really think about it too well. So yeah. uh, there was a little bit of, of that sort of sentiment, which you can find from the enlightenment onwards in uh, full strength in, uh, in the beautiful country that is France. Yeah. Man, speaking of beautiful country, you, you mentioned this took me this. There's a lot of shocking things in here, uh, <laughs> uh, which is great. And, and our, our stories, uh, a lot of sexual sin, like we, they, mim they, they mirror each other a lot. But one of the most shocking things was to hear that you guys think of Americans uh, or, or, or uh, New York as like this beautiful place, the way that we think of like <laughs> Paris, France. And I couldn't believe it. I was blown away. Like, is that true? You guys like Chicago yeah, so, and New so, York and stuff? Yeah. So so when I did, yes, my, my story took me to the, to the, to in con in yeah, so the first to the Caribbean and then uh, through a meeting in the Caribbean then took me to New York. And uh, yes, there was something very exotic about uh, visiting New York. So 
I know it's not, it's a little bit of a different taste because I know that uh, for Americans when they think of Paris it's beautiful it's romantic yeah. uh, but uh, so the French don't tend to think of uh, New York as necessarily beautiful so not necessarily romantic either but it's more of the like it's otherworldly all the skyscrapers mm. and the lights and the noise and the shows at, at every corner uh, all of that is very very different and so to me that was a, a big a cultural shock to uh, visit New York for the first time uh, as a result, uh, as part of my story. Okay. Uh, and when it comes to Paris, though, do do French folks, do you guys also think of Paris as being romantic and stuff? Or is it just like, this is another city for us? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I grew up next to it and uh, it's not... I mean, I guess we we watch enough American movies that we realize <laughs> <laughs> that, that people think of it as a, as a romantic. Uh, but no, this is just where I grew up, and I I would uh, go to my, I went to college in Paris itself, so I would commute there every day. And uh, and yeah, I mean, there's some some uh, aspects of uh, beauty of the buildings and some of the the nice parks uh, that does strike you as beautiful, but it's it's home, so it's less exotic. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. Um, well, I wanted to talk, so, so, um, we can't follow the full story. And like I said, folks, we're not going to, you know, spoil the whole thing and we yeah, couldn't. Yeah. And there's a lot in here to, it would be really hard to spoil it anyways. But, um, you, you succeeded in a lot of things, including volleyball, which was cool. Uh, thinking through that, but I, I figured you would pick up on the sports. Yeah. I got to man. <laughs> yeah. You started lifting weights. I'm like, let's go. This is fantastic. Uh, but, but you mentioned at one point that you wrote your grandfather, uh, I can't say it, daddy. Like, yeah, can yes, you say? Yeah. Can you say yeah, it for me? So, I mean, it is the word daddy uh, okay. in, in English, but uh, we would pronounce it in French, so daddy, okay. simply because he he grew up with a, an English uh, uh, mother, so uh, he, uh -huh. he he was he always identified a bit in in English, so that's why the the term was used in English for him. But okay, but okay, obviously pronounced very Frenchly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So uh, you wrote to him about about happiness. I, I think you yeah. wrote him asking him what is happiness. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's that's kind of uh, one of the first times where after having been an atheist and uh, lived my life in pursuit of my own uh, success and happiness in a number of avenues. Uh, so sports was one of them. Uh, I was playing in competition. Uh, then I was playing music as well and started to play in a band and uh, uh, write our own music, play on on stage, really having fun and getting some moderate amounts of success there uh having success in uh in in school as well uh that i would get a good job so all the avenues in which i was trying to uh, get success and uh happiness and try to find meaning um were working out really well and uh this is the first time where i actually as i was actually challenged to reflect a little bit on uh life itself um, and wondering, okay, well, I'm getting all my, like, I'm, I'm succeeding in all the goals that I had set for myself. I feel like I have accomplished my childhood dreams. Uh, and, you know, it was pleasant and I enjoyed uh, much of that. But I, there was a part of me that was wondering, well, is that all there is? Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm climbing up this mountain, I'm reaching it and no it's it's so it's okay it's good i'm not gonna say it's bad right. but uh it's like it, it, there was a, a a sense of uh a longing for for fulfillment and i wondered like is this really like i'm i'm running after happiness am i catching it mm. um and and if i catch it what do i do with it and so um i was a bit uh, interested to know what people would have uh, thought when they accomplished their life goals like this and I did write to my grandfather because uh, it was, and I guess is still <laughs> my uh, pinnacle for somebody who's lived a very full life and has accomplished a lot of very impressive things. And I wanted to um, to ask him, like, you know, what's happiness to you? Like, what, what's what's your thought? And uh, can you help me figure out what I'm looking for? And what you know, with everything that you've accomplished. Do you feel like you're happy? Uh, yeah. And if so, do you have any keys, you know, for me, for a, a traveler uh, on that same journey, but uh, a, a few uh, a few years be behind you? Well, so this this is like <clears throat> for all the uh, Americans listening. This is like uh, you're you're walking right into all of our stereotypes. Like, oh, there's the existential angst of the Frenchman writing about his grandfather about happiness. We're we're you know our great thing is uh, pragmatic philosophy. That's our stuff. So we're just like, oh, whatever, kid, just keep going. You know, like, don't don't think so much. I, th I think that's hilarious. But um, can you just tell us a little bit about him? There's like all these cool stats of of. Uh, can you characterize uh, your grandfather for us? He's an awesome guy. 
Yes, I mean, he's the, the reason I, I wrote him is because I have tremendous amounts of respect. Uh, he's a very um, off the charts kind of a guy. Uh, mm. for, so he's currently 106. Uh, <laughs> he's still alive. He is still doing really well and he's sharp as a tack. Mm. Uh, and he's got uh, just a, a number of very unusual uh skills so he's got a photographic memory so that he is able to recite poetry that he learned when he was in grade school uh like he's now that he's over 100 years uh, <laughs> you would think that the memory that he takes but yeah when he was, we were little he would just read a book and just remember everything in it uh, it's just unbelievable he he graduated from the most pr uh, famous engineering school in france the most prestigious uh, called uh, Ecole polytechnique mm -hmm. um, and then during his life he uh, i mean he first of all he was he he's, he was alive during both world war right so <laughs> <laughs> put things in perspective in terms of time yeah. uh and in the second world war uh, he was in the military he was uh in uh, in north africa and uh was in charge of securing perimeters that were just as big as, as france itself mm -hmm. um he um he's then after the war he started to, working in the industry uh and he was extremely successful uh he was uh, working in chemistry worked in industrial um ovens de designing the processes for industrial ovens to treat various gases um and then he worked in um, uh, nuclear chemistry uh, nuclear physics wow. so he was one of the uh, he was the lead engineer in charge of designing the process of uh, uranium enrichment that ultimately made france a nuclear power so he's the wow. one who uh, designed the nuclear power for france basically um, and he speaks uh, fluently, I don't know, five, six languages, and he dabbles in six or seven more of those um, and just speaks them fluently. And he's got, through all of that, had six boys, uh, <laughs> and uh, my father is one of them. So yeah. uh, just a, a very uh, strange, unusual, brilliant man with a very accomplished life. And that seemed to be a right person to uh, to ask. Okay, well, with everything that you've done, do would you do you feel happy? Do you feel satisfied? And do you have any tips for me? Yeah. And the problem is obviously that uh, he responded with some things that I could relate to, but he also responded with uh, religious elements. He said, you know, like there are some things that are really meaningful to me, and. He talked about a couple of stories from the Bible, and he talked about uh, uh, the the privilege of uh, reciting the uh, Sermon on the Mount uh, from Jesus uh, on set uh, on the mountain that could have been the mountain uh, that uh, Jesus delivered that sermon. Yeah. So he was telling those stories here in his uh, response, and for me, it was like, "Ah, gag me! I, <laughs> I don't want any religious beliefs here. I, I want some meaning and happiness." Um, and so that's kind of a, a, a first uh, engagement where I was confronted with the idea that, uh, hey, religion is actually in the middle of people's answers when mm. you ask them about the meaning of life. Yeah. Shocking. Yeah. Well, I, I thought that was so cool, too, because this is not, I mean, this is a guy that you love because your grandfather, but also this isn't a guy you can just brush off as being an idiot. Like, he, he's very much no. not an idiot. Yeah, and I think there was a, a degree of uh, cognitive dissonance there on my part because mm -hmm. clearly the guy is a genius. I think the world is the the word is not overstated. Like he's he's a genius, mm -hmm. uh, and yet he did have a, a professed a belief that God exists. But I still maintain that in order to have a belief in God, you really need to be superstitious or not very smart. So obviously those three things together don't work, but I think I still had them firmly implanted in my mind. Yeah. Um, and in my defense, I, I mean, he was clearly, uh, honestly, I think, believing and uh, practicing, but... Uh, it didn't necessarily seem to me like uh, those religious beliefs were at the center of his life or in practice that that they didn't educate a whole lot of what he was doing. I, mm. that, that was just my perception. So okay. um, I, I didn't necessarily get confronted there. But just, that was a, a first glimpse of uh, people starting to talk about religion and Jesus uh, in the center of the quest for meaning. And, and that's something that I wasn't all that comfortable about at the time. Yeah. Well, okay, so so that was one of the first, and then um, there's a lot going on in the book. It's so good, but uh, we we have to talk about Vanessa, whose name has been changed. Uh, yes, <laughs> because there's a lot of detail about her life too, which yeah. she's had a crazy life. But you met her uh, 
Yeah. Is it the Cayman Islands? I, I, I never know. No, in, in the Caribbean. So the, the island is uh, Saint Martin. Uh, okay. Saint Martin is, uh, is an island that is half French and half Dutch. Mm -hmm. And they speak, they speak French on the French side and they speak English on the Dutch side. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's a beautiful uh, Caribbean island. And that's, yes, that's one of the first turning points uh, in my story yeah. uh, that I went there on vacation uh, because my uncle lived there and uh, my parents decided to just buy us tickets uh, to, to go and visit. And I went there with my brother. And uh, it's one of the uh, first ran random occurrences uh, that kind of began to change my life is that uh, we went hitchhiking and mm. uh, we met American tourists who stopped and they were not even stopping to pick us up. They were stopping to ask for direction. Yeah. And uh, we, as it so happened that the uh, hotel they were trying to get to was right next door to the house that we were staying at. So we said, well, you know, we'll tell you where it is if you uh, pick us up. And yeah. uh, that we, we met and uh, we had that uh, first encounter on the island uh, in the Caribbean uh, yeah. with this girl, Vanessa, who was uh, from New York uh, yeah. and uh, that we, that I ended up starting dating. Yeah. Well, so another shocking thing here is uh, you talked about the vacation days and she had like 10 of them and you're like <laughs> in France, we it's, it's mandatory to have three weeks. Is it three weeks? No, no, no. That's five. The minimum is five. The average is seven. My seven. brother has nine weeks. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> That's so nuts. I know. Don't cry, but this is the way it is. <laughs> well, you don't cry either, man. You 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 work here now, so. <laughs> yes, that's right. But uh, I've uh, I've I've evolved and uh, also obtained a, a situation where I have a bit more than the average American. So, That's so, good. That's good. Yeah, it's not French amounts of vacation, but I have enough. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Well, okay, so you're you're talking with Vanessa. Um, you guys got to jump in to, to get more of the details, but eventually, I mean, you guys start, you spark up a relationship and you have this long distance relationship, yeah. but she tells you two things that, that freak you out, that she believes in God, she's a Christian and that she doesn't want to have premarital sex. Yeah. Which is both absolutely absurd uh, on, on both counts uh, in my uh, worldview at the time. And so that this is a problem, but, uh, and, and for anybody else, uh, I would have probably said, all right, let's forget about this. Yeah, seriously, uh, but what what was the deal there? Like, what? I mean, she's she used to be a model, I guess. Is that is that part of it? That's that's a big part of it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> she was she was a model and actress, and uh, it was very exotic, right? There was yeah. this uh, meeting on the other side of the world in the Caribbean, uh, randomly with a uh, hitchhiking. I mean, this is the stuff of movies. And uh, my uh, little French romantic heart was like, all right, let's let's press through and let's let's crack through the defenses and make this happen mm -hmm. and also the fact that there's barriers i mean it's again very romantic right so it's like they, okay they're obstacle like let's go and slay the dragon and then right right away. totally uh, so there was a bit of that uh, and i i figured look uh, i'm gonna just uh, convince her that all of this is nonsense uh, and we'll be happy and uh, that that will work out in the end that was my mindset when coming back to france after my vacation in the caribbean yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we were now in a long distance, very problematic relationship yeah. where my new life goal was to prove that her beliefs uh, in God and uh, in moral ethic, in uh, sexual ethics were misguided so that we could be together and happy. Yeah, I love that that's the dragon, right? Like squash her faith, <laughs> like extinguish her faith and get her in, the, in bed. I, I've been in the same situation uh, as well. And you think back on it, and you're like, Lord, are you sure you want me? Are you sure that I'm the one who you, you've chosen? Uh, and it just shows how awesome he is that he can use wretches like us to, uh, to do his, his work, man. It's awesome. So, uh, I want, so Vanessa comes to visit you. This is, this is an interesting point. Um, the whole thing's interesting, but she looks up a church or uh, one of her friends looks up a church. Uh, for you guys to go to. Did she, did she go to the church when, when she was there? I can't remember. If no, she, she, did. she didn't, which is really the interesting part. So uh, yeah. she had been, and that was to me just one of the concerning things. The first time she came to France that she had to be given a, a, an address of the yeah. church. Like, oh, I'm obviously not going to go. What right. is she going to do? Like waste uh, half a day of her vacation with me too so that she could go to a church that she's never been to? That seems to me like over the top religious, so red alert, you know, red flags. Um, but uh, in the end, she didn't go, but she had uh, received it on my computer. Uh, and so um, uh, a bit later on, when I started to be investigating those things, 
uh, and I needed to get a sense of what those Christians do when they get together, yeah. um, I was able to go on my computer and dig up the address and go without having to tell anybody. So that was yeah. kind of another one of those providential twists that uh, I was able to get this address and I went and visited that uh, Christian church in, in Paris. And, um, and it was an evangelical Protestant church, right? I, I don't know the, the denominations over there, but... Yeah, yeah, that was an evangelical church, uh, absolutely. So, and to me, that was a brand novelty. I'd never seen right. any such thing. So I figured, okay, well, I need to understand what those weirdo Christians do when they get together. And that was really part of my investigation there. Yeah. yeah. Well, another uh, like providential turn is uh, they had good music there. And you were a musician. You learned how to play. You were in a band. Yeah. You, you played yeah, uh, yeah. piano. And uh, and so they had good music, which is another another great thing. I love when Christians have good music. Yeah, there, there was lots of different... Uh, I mean, again, you, you read the story and you'll see all of those improbabilities piling up and making yeah. you smile at what kind of story God is writing, almost showing off. Mm -hmm. um, the, the music is one piece. The, the the very fact that I was even available on a Sunday morning to even attend a church because at the time I was still playing in nationals uh, in volleyball. So mm -hmm. every weekend I would travel around the country to play games and so not play not go to church on sunday right. um and uh, yet somehow god made it happen with a very unexplainable injury uh so that again against my will i, I found myself available and needed to visit that church um and yes i was impressed by the music uh, but obviously i couldn't sing because there was religious lyrics so yeah uh, it's not something i could do uh but yes that that uh, will visit at the church was uh when another one of those turning points uh where i discovered, okay, this is what those Christians do. And then there's another one of those uh, very strange events that happened, which is that as I was trying to escape the church, uh, I just got caught uh, on the doorstep with a very strange wave of chill in my uh, stomach going up in my chest and grabbing me by the throat. Uh, and I was frozen on the doorstep trying to escape and uh, heard myself uh, thinking, this is ridiculous. I have to figure this out. And I... Uh, turn, turn around, close the door, and uh, walk straight to the head pastor and uh, introduce myself. Yeah. <laughs> that's so, so awesome. And and that's that's Robert, right? Yes, that's right. So that's that's Robert, who is an American pastor, uh, but who had been a missionary to France uh, for many years uh, and uh, still is in France. So he's now lived in France longer than I have. <laughs> oh, wow. But uh, yes, he was a, an American pastor, uh, pastoring a, a French church in uh, yeah. in Paris. <laughs> Well, Guillaume, uh, just taking the excursus off of off of the story, uh, this is something that always is curious to me. So, so you you lifted weights. Your whole life was like chasing girls. That that was my story as well. Uh, then you go into this Christian church, and yeah, they got cool music and stuff, but Christians are still pretty weird. Um, do you maybe maybe we have to cut this if if it's too revealing? Do you ever do you ever still wrestle with the weirdness of of like? corny christianity at all do you, does that ever mess with you coming from a non-church background non-evangelical you didn't grow up learning how to do the dance does it ever still do you ever still wrestle with the cheesiness or no uh i mean yes i i see what you're talking about and i don't wrestle with it as much as i'm trying to live <laughs> through it mm. uh, but at, at the time i wasn't at all uh, troubled by this because the um, the church didn't i wouldn't describe them as as weird uh, okay. i mean it, it felt weird to me because it was just very new but there was nothing corny about what they were doing on the okay. contrary i was struck by the authenticity because uh when I walked in uh, that church, I was trying to you know, have nobody come and talk to me. I was hoping <laughs> to just observe silently. And just uh, two minutes after I walked in, there's a very friendly guy, a little bit older than me, who came, introduced himself very friendly, said, hey, come over, come with us. We're going to pray. And yeah. to me, that was like, oh, what? Uh, but he we just walked over there was a group of them standing up in a circle and they started to pray and for me at the time prayer was going to be reciting some sort of a thing that you've memorized oh, right uh, that was very inauthentic and so it, that they were just standing there and just casually talking to god like like there's actually somebody listening on the other side uh that was very unusual but ra rather authentic uh, rather than corny so uh, yeah. to me that that struck me as a, an interesting piece like at least hey they really believe what they're saying here yeah like, they, they really mean it man that's awesome i i uh yeah that is the auth authenticity is awesome the church i'm going to right now is is fantastic with that uh i i, so I work as a, as a campus missionary 
uh, uh, with Athletes in Action. And uh, usually I'm on alert for the people that I bring. If I'm bringing someone who's not a Christian, they're interested in coming to church. And I'm like, dude, please let nothing go you know, weird today. And one of the worst times I, I brought this dude in, we were talking about Jordan Peterson for like like three or four months, uh, and and I was trying to you know sucker him in, and so he, he comes to church with me, and one of the the kids from Moody, uh, Moody undergrad student, he's at the door and he just goes greetings and Lord Jesus, and I was like, dude, why can't you just greet us? You don't have to say greetings, dang it! And I looked over and I was way more uncomfortable than the guy I brought. He didn't he didn't hit him at all, and he told me about how how what, what a great time, even though I was catching like I thought this was cheesy and corny. It was really just me projecting on him, and and he caught a lot of that. So that's good to hear that that uh, you th- that they were really authentic, and and you were if there was any weirdness, it was yeah. just because you were an outsider and you weren't used to this kind of stuff. Yeah, and we tend to be more self conscious than uh, than the folks who are visiting. Actually, um, mm. I we also have to understand that the Holy Spirit works in the heart and in the mind of the person in ways that. You, you don't know what filters in and what doesn't. I mean, yeah. if you think of my first visit to that church, I don't remember a single word that the pastor said in his mm-hmm. entire sermon. And yet I was listening, but there was some sort of a, a veil, some sort of a, a ignorance, or some sort of a, an awkwardness that made me not focus. So I don't know, but I do not remember a single word that he said. Mm-hmm. So you could think like oh there's an unbeliever he's sitting through a sermon that every word is probably important and to that no i I didn't catch a (laughs) single word that he said (laughs) but what what was important is that i just i got to see people i got to see the authenticity of their prayers uh i got to see the music of the worship and i had this strange experience when i was trying to escape and you can't manufacture that (laughs) (laughs) so you you can be self-conscious all you want Uh, it's the holy spirit who really drives the the world show so um, we make ourselves available. We certainly aim for authenticity, but I don't think we need to be too self-conscious about yeah. uh, about greetings in the Lord Jesus. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I'm, I wish I would have known that before. So, uh, so you you set out to disprove Christianity because, uh, well, to disprove specifically Vanessa's Christianity, and uh, she called you out one time because she's like, "Hey, you don't even know what I believe," and you're like, "Yeah, that's right. Okay." So then you got these chills, and you're like, "What what's going on with this?" What what was it about Robert that made you keep coming back? Like, why did you did you trust him? Mm-hmm. Was he authentic? Like, why would you keep going back? You, you started meeting with him regularly. Seems like yeah, regularly. That, yeah, that's that's right. Because when I introduced myself and I say, "All right, uh, you believe in God?" Yes. <laughs> How does that work? Well, let's let's make an appointment and let's talk about it. And I went there and I had my questions. Basically, I was trying to understand like how how does he believe those things? Uh, and he seemed to be intelligent. Uh, he was expressing himself very well. He was educated. He had a, a, a degree in psychology, I believe. Um, and he um, didn't seem to be compensating for some uh, emotional imbalance of any sort. Uh, yeah. He just was a very just stand-up guy. Uh, but he strongly believed that uh, God exists and that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so I, I needed to. I was confronted with this very strangely. And uh, I needed to understand. Obviously, I needed to try to understand what he believes be- to to get a sense of what she believed. Um, and um, I was trying to probe it a little bit into understanding. Well, how, how do you claim to know those things? Uh, what's your life experience? Uh, what are some of the beliefs that you actually have? Um, and we had those conversations and he seemed to be um, yeah, authentic, absolutely. Uh, I mean, he would start by praying for me, which again, uh, made me feel awkward, uh, mm-hmm. but was at least reassuring that, okay, at least he believes this stuff. Um, and so that, that was a little bit of the mix that I saw in Robert. And uh, he was competent enough to answer my questions and provide coherent answers within his own worldview um, and to just refer biblically to, okay, this is what we believe and here's why. And so I wouldn't say that he was engaging in positive apologetics, like giving me uh, philosophical arguments for God's existence or the reliability of the Bible or such things. But he was very clear in expressing the the Christian faith um, and answering my questions uh, when I started to... Uh, really get interested into okay what is it what what is your deal guy give me the sales speech yeah. um that, that, that he was very effective there yeah well so then how did uh how did you move from being well curious because you wanted to disprove to then starting to be like hey i want to i think i believe this 
Yeah, so it, it was a very uh, fine balancing act because uh, there was parts of me that uh, wanted this to not be true, obviously. Uh, but I figured if I'm going to uh, objectively uh, investigate those things, I need to force myself to be a bit more open than I want to be. Mm. Uh, and then at the same time, I was also aware that um, if I was going to fail to convince Vanessa and I still wanted to be with her, there might be a part of me that now would want to start to see that this is true as well. Mm. And it was clear to me that both of those were present and uh, or at least potentially present, but they didn't cancel out each other. <laughs> so so uh, I still needed to be very clear in keeping all of those considerations really off the table in my assessment of this. Could this uh, possibly be true? Um, and so the... That, that, that's the emotional aspect and the, okay, the, the, keeping the biases out of that. And then there's a number of intellectual uh, uh, expectations that I had uh, that needed to be met. Uh, so I was figuring out that this is a number of knowledge claims that Christians are making, right? They're mm -hmm. saying that there is a God. Well, you know, that's, that's a big deal. Like if that's true, there's lots of things that follow from that. Um, and the world is going to be different, right? Uh, then they are making claims about what happened to Jesus and mm -hmm. they are making claims about even their current experience. You know, like this is Christianity is true today, right now. Uh, and what we're doing, you know, we're meeting in church. There's something supernatural about this. There's there's a number of claims that are made. Um, and I wanted to probe a little bit into those and understand uh, where is this coming from and is this even reasonable? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a number of intellectual shifts that needed to happen in my conversations and so several of them took place uh, as part of either my conversations with Robert or my own thinking about the issues uh, for the period of several months that I would go and speak with Robert. Um, uh, so that we can get into any of those if, uh, if that's uh, of interest to you. Um, yeah. But uh, I changed my mind on, on my view of, uh, well, the Christian view of sex and uh, marriage. That's for one, uh, because that was a big hurdle for me, even though that's not necessarily one that's determinative of whether Christianity is true. That was an important uh, question of whether Christianity is good. Um, and there's a, a lot of shifts that happen in my view of uh, science and knowledge. Like, what does it take for you to know anything? Uh, there's a lot of shifts that happen in there. Um, so uh, my my expectations with respect to certainty, right? So how yeah. certain do I need to be about those things? Um, and uh, then also my understanding of salvation. So the message that the Christians were teaching about what uh, saves a, a sinner, uh, that's something that uh, I made, that made sense intellectually as part of my uh, reflections. Um, but also that came in the context of a very strong experiential uh, encounter as well. So yeah. there's, in, in my story, a number of times where the uh, intellectual uh, and the experiential are meeting and the, the experiences between the, the random hitchhiking on the other side of the world, the um, uh, experience trying to leave the church and being caught with this weird sense when this blast of chill and then there was later on in my questioning uh, a very strong experience uh, as I was starting to uh, consider the possibility that Christianity would be true um, I won't spoil it for the reader but uh, some other stuff happened and really shifted in my heart at the same time that my intellect was starting to shift uh, on those important intellectual questions of uh, knowledge, science, miracles, uh, certainty, and uh, and and the reliability of the of the scriptures as well. So these yeah. are some of the topics that I um, reflected upon. I, I wouldn't say research because uh, you imagine the folks are you know, reading tons of books, but <laughs> yeah. there was there was a, a deep thinking and discussing those issues with Robert. And these are the topics that uh, that really shifted in my mind intellectually. Yeah, it's so awesome to think about Robert and the the role that God had him play in, in your life. Like, man, we need more Roberts out there. You know, it's so cool to to see his his patience with you and uh the fact that he was someone who you felt comfortable coming back to uh and, and having good conversations with. Uh just lest lest anyone think that uh for the ladies listening, that missionary dating is like a great thing because we can look at uh, Guillaume here and say, Look, missionary dating's great. Like 
that didn't work out and uh, you're not with Vanessa any longer. Uh, you actually no, have... that's correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that was a very instrumental piece in uh, getting my uh, finger into the, the clockworks, right? And getting sucked yeah. into that, that big, deep question. Um, but uh, yeah, I won't spoil the story. So the, yeah. the whole, uh, uh, the, the whole narr narrative of how, how trying to make this work and uh, pursuing this, um, that did lead me to actually uh, leave everything in France and move to the US. Um, and uh, and yes, we uh, the, our relationship ended up terrible and uh, it didn't work out, and yeah. so we broke up. And that was another uh, pivotal turning point uh, in my young Christian faith um, to figure out life. Uh, okay, like, I feel like God has dragged me out of this, yeah. uh, has used all of that, um, and uh, now I'm there and by myself. And well, by the way. Thank God it didn't work out. I mean, our relationship yeah. was terrible, and uh, we were planning to get married, but that would have been a tragic mistake. So yeah. um, that that was really working out well, and it was all again in the grand weaving of uh, God's story there. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, I, obviously, I, I have mixed feelings because this was very instrumental in bringing about some really good things for me. But I, I wouldn't recommend the missionary getting part <laughs> of that. And uh, right. young Christian ladies, if you meet a French atheist in the Caribbean and uh, start a long distance relationship, this is probably not a great idea for your side. Yeah, seriously, um, man, that's so good. Um, well, OK, so I want to talk a little bit about your education, because uh, I think at this point, like even when you when you vet, met Vanessa, um, you already were a software engineer. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I was an engineer, so I had finished college. Uh, I had uh, studied math, physics, and engineering science in in college. Um, it's uh, it's it's called the Grandes Écoles in French. It's, uh, it's a little bit out. It's not the university. It's, it's okay. like private schools on the on the side of that that you enter with uh, two years of prep work that's called an in a prep school okay uh, so the class preparatoire and then you have three years of an engineering uh, degree and you walk out of this with a uh, engineering degree yeah like diplôme d'ingénieur and uh, they also everything sounds the... so much better in French it's amazing yeah of course it is. that's that's what you do that's so uh, good I, uh, I'm and, sure and we it, have names for all that stuff. It's like a technical school. Like, uh, yeah, we, we got those yeah. too, but they don't sound like that. Yeah, yeah, not nearly. And then at the end, they all, they give you the, the equivalency with a master's uh, of science. In oh, there. Okay. So this is what I did. Now, I did I did a fairly prestigious school, not like uh, like my grandfather prestigious school. Okay. <laughs> he, yeah. he did the top notch. I did a little bit less, uh, but still a very good uh, school that would secure that I would be a, a fairly uh, comfortable engineer uh, as a beginning of my career. Well, so then, I mean, you, uh, I don't think this spoils anything or anything, but you, you did an MA in biblical literature. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, so that's with, was, but uh, you had a job and stuff like why, why the heck, why were you doing that? Yeah, so now we're still way back after the conversion uh, in New York, uh, yeah. where, um, uh, where the breakup has happened and uh, this is where i find myself starting to explain to my family and friends uh in france why i hadn't lost my mind uh the, some <laughs> questions starting to to come to my way and i started to explain to them well look this is what happened to me and uh, here's what i've discovered and here are some of the things that i've thought about and i had no idea what apologetics was at the time but i unwittingly started to engage in that very discipline of giving answers to uh, critical questions about the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And um, as a result, I mean, I, I was starting to share some of the good thinking that I had done at the time um, and answer some of their objections. And I, I realized, hey, I, I, I actually can do that. Uh, look at that. They are, they are sending objections and I can think of the right response and I say, no, here's what's wrong with that and because. And, uh, and there was a part of me that was really fulfilled and really excited to, to do that. Um, and I, I, fig I figured I could do that well. Obviously, I stumbled as well. Rereading re some of the old stuff I said, I said <laughs> oh, no, that, that wasn't quite right. Um, but, but just a, a good sense that this was a good thing to do. And, uh, and I got to get sucked in again in thinking very deeply about those issues and researching. So at that point, I started to really research uh, by books, stuff that I had never done, uh, by a book that wasn't mandatory for college. I had never done that before. Yeah. So I started, started reading for my own sake and uh, enjoying it and then watching documentaries and uh, lectures and debates. Um, and just sharpening my mind on those, uh, those things and using this material to interact with my uh, skeptical friends uh, and family. 
Um, and that at some point I was enjoying this so much and I was in a place where I had zero social commitment because God had carried me out of my volleyball team and my band and my family and all of my friends. Uh, I was now in, in the US and by myself and just had my job. Then I ended up being available to do this every evening and every mm -hmm. weekend. And I enjoyed every mo moment of it. It was a very, like, I, I still have very fun feelings about this season of my life right after the conversion and the breakup of studying those things all the time and learning and discovering, hey, this is cool. There's a mm -hmm. wealth of material. Um, and then I, I just realized after doing this all evening and all weekend long that I might as well get a degree out of it. So yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I applied. And yes, I, I was working still. But uh, thankfully, the seminary that I attended in New York, uh, which is Alliance Theological Seminary, uh, allowed uh, evening classes and weekend mm -hmm. classes. So I would just take all evening classes after. So I was working on Wall Street. Uh, I was a software engineer uh, on the trading floor of a bank during the day. And then I was a seminary student at night and on the weekends. So yeah, that's awesome. Well, okay. So then, then you you went on to do a PhD uh, in philosophical theology, and that that was under Paul Helm, right? He didn't just that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. So uh, that's uh, that was another wonderful story of providential uh, guidance uh, to land yeah. in the right place, uh, and did my uh, philosophical work, uh, my uh, PhD work, yeah, in the in philosophical theology under Paul Helm so awesome and and uh for folks uh listening if you want to hear more about that we've we've done an episode uh where we cover uh some man it's so deep i don't think i think we only cover like two things like manipulation and the um god givenness principle which is huge i mean it's a huge part of your, your work but um for folks interested in hearing more about guillaume's uh philosophical work and theological work check that out because it was a fun, fun conversation and dude we gotta i gotta have you back on to, to do even more of that um why 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 phd though like so so after the ma you probably had enough to uh to defend against your, your friends and family right so so why keep going on to a phd yeah so uh, i mean the whole thing is again like i i, I would I would hate to pretend like I had a grand plan for my life. <laughs> I mean, when, when you pick up the book, uh, the readers can tell that I didn't plan any of it. Mm -hmm. I was just you know, dragged by the collar by God, <laughs> one step at a time, and just right. you know, walking backwards uh, through the small door. So it's, it was all, when I look back and see all the wonderful uh, coordination of events, it seems like it's completely weaved by the grand weaver. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Um, as far as my thoughts were concerned, it was really one step at a time. So I had my master's. Uh, I went for the master's, got the master's in New Testament studies. Um, I uh, I didn't even set out to do a PhD immediately after that. Uh, but then I went back to the seminary maybe a year after I graduated and uh, simply took an, uh, a class that I audited because you can audit a class for free after you get the degree. And I audited a class with my New Testament uh, professor who by the time by that time had become kind of a friend a friend to me. Uh, there was a couple of teachers at the seminary who I befriended through my masters, mm -hmm. and uh, at the end just casually said, "So Guillaume, when do you start PhD work?" And I, I had thought about it, but I wasn't too sure. To me, PhD was when you're trying to be a teacher, right? So right. When you're trying to be a scholar, a, a professor in the in school. And that wasn't necessarily what I was trying to do. Uh, by that time, I had now met my wife, a wonderful American woman who uh, made it all worth uh, for, <laughs> for sure. Um, but we were also expecting our, our first child. Um, and uh, it seemed clear that I needed to continue to have the uh, income of an engineer uh, <laughs> and, and not just uh, throw that away and start to have uh, student debt instead right. of uh, engineering income. So uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't really see myself do that, but then realize, uh, okay, if I do my uh, PhD in the UK, uh, I don't need to have any classes or comprehensive exams. It's purely the research and the writing of the dissertation. And um, as far as usage is concerned, I figured, look, it's going to bring some degree of sharpening. Uh, like I'm going to get to a, a next stage in terms of a professional proficiency in what I'm doing. And it's going to open doors in the future for things that I may not be planning right now, but that might be helpful when the time comes. And I figured, you know, if for no other reason, just to teach in my retirement, right? So when I've mm. uh, worked enough and uh, provided for my family uh, through engineering uh, long enough that I just want to retire, um, I want to be engaged in ministry and in 
meaningful ways. And I figured if I'm going to be teaching at the university, that sounds like a lot of fun, then I'm going to need a PhD. So that, that could be helpful to have that. Uh, yeah. So uh, it was just a natural one step after another. And okay. I, I usually describe it as a hobby that got out of hand. That's, that's all it is. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, who <laughs> but I don't need to tell you. I mean, uh, you're the serial stu student. Uh, <laughs> why, why so many? Well, you know, you just take one step <laughs> at a time. And, and my my wife, one. hopefully she won't listen to this. Uh, yeah, you're, you're right, though, totally. It, with you, the funny thing is uh, that retire, that that date that you can retire gets pushed back with every kid and you keep having more and more kids. So <laughs> yes, the, the, really. the, the amount of wealth you'll have to accumulate to take care of them is, uh, it might be sad. Yeah. Yeah. So, but no, it's wonderful. I have five young kids and I love every one of them. Yeah. And, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, yes, this is it. So we, we, we've got okay. the team. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> well, um, uh, there's a lot more that, uh, we could cover, uh, but it would take so much time because the book's dense. It's great. Uh, if you know anything about Guillaume, you know that he's got a great sense of humor and it shows up. There's a couple of times where I literally laughed out loud, um, which is just super funny, man. So uh, thanks for putting your life on display here for us. Um, what, so you'll, you'll notice those uh, interested in apologetics. He does mention William Lane Craig a lot in here. And so for the reform folks out there, uh, man, James Anderson has been working on them. Uh, I still pray for him, so we'll see if we can get him over on the, the presuppositional side. But there is a lot of women than Craig. Um, oh, that is funny. Yes. <laughs> uh, there's there's one last question, one serious question here, uh, before we let you go, man. So on the cover, are, are these your glasses, or is this like is this false advertising? That is funny. Uh, so this is not actually my glasses, but okay. they were selected to look a lot like mine. So uh, you know how <laughs> things work. The publisher finds the the pictures, but. Uh, they, they, were, they weren't looking for glasses that would look like my ears. Okay. All right. We can forgive that. That's awesome. Well, uh, yeah, Guillaume, th thanks so much for, uh, thanks for, for the book, man. Thanks for, for sharing your story and uh, the, all the details that you share, which uh, really bring the story to life and help us. The, the honesty there is refreshing and it helps a lot of us with similar stories resonate, man. So I really appreciate that. Appreciate the intellectual rigor. We haven't really talked about this. I haven't talked about this, but you do drop in a lot of quotes from atheists and French atheists. Um, not, not the typical ones that you're used to. There's not a ton of Sam Harris or anything in there, but um, you, there's a, there's a dialogue going on along the way between the intellectual dialogue of you and, and popular objection. So it, it very much yeah. is still a, a work of apologetics, even though it is uh, your, your life story as well. Yeah, very much so. And I was trying to do that, uh, trying to reflect on what, what I can bring uh, to the American audience that is not uh, another boring book of apologetics. Right. So, and I'm never thinking that apologetics is boring, but I'm trying to assess, look, uh, in France, there's very little apologetic material. So any discussion of the classical arguments for God's existence is huge. In the US, the market is a little bit flooded. There's a lot of very smart people who can present those arguments maybe better than I do. Um, so uh, what I did here, as I use my conversion story to as a kind of a springboard to discuss some of the big questions that arose in terms of apologetics, I also did that in conversation with some of the uh, key atheist, French atheist philosophers and thinkers uh, in such a way that the American apologist or philosopher who is very familiar with apologetics still is going to get a little bit of an exotic uh, touch out of the, the, those parts. So I'm hoping that they get also entertained by the story. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but even the very apologetic bits should be a little bit more exotic to them because I interact with folks like Voltaire or Michel Onfray or André Comte-Sponville or Ernest Renan. And uh, one of my favorites is the Baron d'Holbach, the Baron of Holbach uh, from the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Very colorful, very uh, eloquent uh, French skeptics who really tell, give you a piece of their minds. So I interact <laughs> with those uh, colorful actors and uh, that's uh, what I'm hoping is entertaining to the American philosopher who's very familiar with the apologetics. Definitely. And, and, uh, at first I was like, how come I haven't heard of these people? And then I saw what you're doing and I was like, this is great, man. Uh, that was really cool. And, and it's called confessions. And, you know, obviously you, I don't know how much, uh, you were even allowed to, uh, to name it. I know the editors get a hold of the work and they name it or whatever, but it is kind of an homage to Augustine's confessions because it's the same thing. It's an intellectual, uh, conversion story. Same thing with uh, C.S. Lewis's Surprised by Joy. So it's very much in that bioi. If you're anyone familiar with the, the bioi, it's a biography with like a specific end in mind. There's like an apologetic bioi that, that comes through. And 
um, this falls in line with that. It's, it's fantastic, man. So I really appreciate the story, the book. Uh, thanks for coming on and sharing your time with me, man. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. And so uh, I'm really glad that you enjoyed the book. And, and yes, it is a confession in the quite literal sense that there's yeah. a lot of uh, just explaining this is what happened. This is what I did, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, and thankfully, uh, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Amen. And that's the, the, the positive note that this all brings, that uh, God uh, redeems the ugliness and he makes something really beautiful. Yeah, it's awesome, man. Well, so uh, where can folks find uh, more of your stuff if they're if they're interested? Uh, yeah, so well, obviously my books are on sale wherever they, they sell books. So the Confessions of the French Atheist is a bit of a more of a popular level, uh, accessible book with the entertaining story and um, popular level apologetic. Uh, there's my work on free will that's uh, my, in my book, Excusing Sinners and Blaming God. And then uh, any of my writings, uh, can, or, or lectures, they can uh, simply Google my name if they can spell it, uh, and then <laughs> everything will, will come up. So yeah. Uh, there's, I have a bunch of stuff on YouTube and then some of the uh, blog articles that I might have written can be found if you Google my name. Awesome. Uh, and Guillaume, if, if, they, if you ever get a chance to do an audio book of this, that would sell a billion copies because uh, I would that's, listen that's to you. That's an interesting question. I don't know if the, the editor is going to want the French accent and the authenticity or oh, they man, want to we favor need something that's more understandable. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, can yeah, imagine maybe. just uh, an American swine like me reading, uh, trying to read all the French. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. Well, um, folks, this has been Parker's Pensies. That's going to have to do it for us for now. Uh, Guillaume's got some other really cool stuff in the works. I hope it's still in the works. And uh, I'm hoping to uh, to talk about that in a future time. So everyone uh, pay attention for that. Stay tuned. Go back and listen to our other episode where we talk about some more of his philosophical theology work. And uh, yeah, find him uh, elsewhere. Um, thanks for, for stopping in. And if you like this video, please give it an actual like here on YouTube. Uh, leave me a comment or review on Apple Podcasts. That would be huge. And if you have benefited from this podcast, please consider becoming a Patreon patron. All right, enough selling myself. That's it for, for now, folks. Thanks. Peace.